today, Gabe. I know, right? I was going to do this outside. Um, I know. I saw that when I went over the last time to do that testimonial that they do, they were doing the check-in right inside versus outside because it had gotten so... Yeah. We're recording now. I'm sorry, guys. I got a little bit of an emergency at work, so I'm trying okay. to work my phone and this at the same time. I apologize. Okay. It's I've recording. Made, uh, you and yeah, it's recording. You and Gabe are um, hosts, so you can control the mute and unmute as well. Now you should be able to. So um, uh, I'll do my best here, but I, I apologize for my um, my little situation. So no, that's all right. Take care of what you need to. So let's see. Um, I guess since we're recording it, we'll, we can go ahead and just kind of start. Uh, there's not a whole lot of people on here, but not everybody likes to hear me talk anyways. So uh, I first want to thank everybody that's on here and thank Michael Beaver with Methodist Hospital Northeast. Nailed it again. It's easier when I type it because I can fix it when I mess it up. Um, and Dr. Kellum, of course, with Kellum Medicine. Thank you, Gabe and Christmas and Will for getting this going. I'm going to let Mitzi Delgado, one of our diplomats, talk for just one second before we get things going because there's a, a relatively new announcement for one of our nonprofits. So, oh, she's unmuted. Perfect. So, Mitzi Delgado. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so literally this is going to take less than five minutes. Um, I spoke with uh, Christy Williams and her team yesterday with the Guadalupe County Children's Advocacy Center. As you guys know, we did a big event for them last October. Um, which was great. And um, they were not able to have their annual um, shirts um, designer purse bingo this year, which is one of their big fundraisers. Um, and of course they rely a lot on fundraising um, to do what they do for the kids of Guadalupe County. So they have actually come up with a really innovative way um, to do a sort of virtual, but also sort of in-person event um, while we probably could get 150 people together in a room for three hours. They're just not comfortable doing that yet. Um, so they're going to do a, um, they're gonna call it the designer purse bingo grab and go. Um, they've actually done a really good job and have created a website that will be available for folks. Um, they're partnering with Blue Bonnet. Um, Blue Bonnet is going to provide all of the food. Um, so similar to how we did our um, ribeye luncheon, where we pre-ordered our meal with Leonard and his team there. Um, you'll be able to order plates um, and then go pick them up at Blue Bonnet through their drive-through like we did for the ribeyes. But while you're there, all of the designer purses that they're going to be giving away during this um, event are gonna be there. So if people wanna see them in person, they can. Um, and then what the website is doing, it's creating sort of a bucket system. So um, at a lot of the different charity events, you get a raffle ticket and you go put your ticket in the favorite purse that you like, or you put your ticket in the favorite basket that you like, and then they draw at the end of the night. Well, they're going to do that virtually on a website. So you're going to be able to purchase tickets um, that will be assigned to you for the various purses that they're going to have to give away. Um, so the event is going to run they're kind of nailing, we're going to finalize dates tomorrow, um, but either the week before July 4th or the week after. So we really need some help getting the word out. Um, we still need some purses. There are a lot of people who said they were going to donate and then when it didn't happen that they are circling back up with, but um, the more purses we have, the more money we can help raise for the advocacy center. I am putting the link to the Facebook event in the chat. Um, I'm also going to send that to Mindy so that she can disseminate that out. And then she's gonna do um, next week's um, um, spotlight member with the Advocacy Center. We're gonna talk about it some more. So just help us get the word out to folks. The more we can do that as quickly as possible, the more we can help them try to salvage um, their spring big fundraiser. Um, and hopefully um, we'll be able to have a little bit more normalcy for their one that they normally hold in Seguin in November. So that's all I have, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mitzi. Um, Guadalupe Children Advocacy is really big here in our community. We like to support them as, as much as we can. And of course, with all nonprofits, I'm sure Hugh um, can feel this too. You know, a lot of the events being canceled, they're not bringing the money that the funds in that they, that they need. So any support we can give our community and our nonprofits would be appreciated. 
So without further ado, I sent a quick text just to remind everybody again, and I, obviously it was really quick because I said hope instead of hop onto the Zoom call. Um, so if other people get in here, that would be awesome, but we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. First, I just want to um, introduce uh, somebody who's very familiar to us, Gabe Farias with Callum Family Medicine, also the chair of our board. That's right. Thank you guys so very much. Uh, again, as, as Mindy alluded earlier, this, this event uh, is kind of a byproduct of our last luncheon that we had, uh, where one of our providers, uh, Art Campsey, came in and, and kind of gave, just a, answered a few questions from some of our business members. And uh, the need for more information, the want for more information, uh, was pretty high by a lot of our members. So that's why we were able to pull together these two fantastic gentlemen to, to speak on from A, a general practice side, and from B, uh, a provider side, and from B, a, a hospital side. So uh, we're gonna start this by introducing the uh, second best looking guy in the room uh, next to me, and that's my boss, Dr. Danny Kellum. Sorry, Michael. Uh, Will, I'll take, Will, I, I'll take Will I, don't, I don't even know what no. Will's going for. Look at, look at Will's look, man, that, good gosh. He's not even paying attention, look at him. He hasn't shaved in like, I don't know, six weeks. Nine weeks. Anyways, Dr. Daniel Kellum, uh, been work I've been working for the company for three years now, and uh, I have seen firsthand the difference that this that this company makes in not only this tri county community, but in this South Texas area. We've got patients from as far out as Divine. We've got patients in Wilson County. I, I think I can count four different counties where we we serve patients in in this clinic. Uh, we've got two clinics. His brother is an OBGYN in Westover Hills. Uh, so with that, uh, Dr. Daniel Kellum, the uh, principal of Kellum Physician Partners. Dr. Kellum. How are you, Gabe? Thank you. We're sitting right next to each other. It's kind of weird. I can literally hear you through my executive office that I have here, which is also the, uh, the broom closet slash uh, supply room. So yes. Nice. Yeah. But Dr. Kellum, you can just talk a little bit about yourself and, and uh, you know, a little bit about Kellum Family Medicine. Sure. Well, I, my name is Daniel Kellum. I've been practicing family medicine here for almost 25 years. I've uh, been in the shirts area. We purchased this practice here, got 20 plus years ago, but in earnest have been here coming up on about seven or eight years now. Um, we take care of a wide variety of things. We certainly have enjoyed being a part of this community. It's really been a blessing for us as a, as a practice and an organization and certainly have, have loved having a partnership with Michael Beaver and Northeast Methodist in terms of utilizing their hospital. They, they do a wonderful job in caring for the people of our community. And so, you know, we're just, we're glad to be here. We appreciate the support we get from the community and we're, we count our blessings every day that we get to, to serve the wonderful people of this county. Uh, and, and our other guest obviously is, is Michael Beaver. He's the CEO of, of uh, Methodist Northeast. Mindy, did I get that right? No? Close. Nor okay, Methodist, okay. Mindy Methodist help. Hospital Northeast. Methodist Hospital Northeast. Okay, there you go. Uh, three quarters of the... Of the way right. Close okay. Uh, I've known Michael for about a year now. Uh, I know that he's a huge Texas Longhorn fan. I'm writing all the notes down right no, here. No, uh, no, 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 no. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right. right. Sorry. 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 Uh, uh, Michael is a guy who's, who's been a transformative thing. Oh, by the way, just for the record, he's a huge Oklahoma State fan. Just, just so that go. everybody I, knows. Yeah. And when I, when I get, go to at, be admitted into Northeast Methodist, they tell me, first of all, get the name of the hospital right. Second, you're on the blacklist, so you are not going to get admitted. Uh, but yeah, Michael is a transformative person in this community. Uh, he really goes uh, uh, above and beyond for his patients, for this region. He knows and sees the importance of health and wellness from, from all aspects. And uh, really proud to, to call him a friend, call him a, a, a a, uh, a partner with Kellen Family Medicine. So with that, Mr. Beaver, Oklahoma State, go Cowboys. You're up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Appreciate you getting that right. The most important part, getting that correct about my Cowboys. Uh, no, I appreciate having the opportunity to visit with you all today. Um, you know, we are, our hospital has been growing pretty dramatically over the last few years as our community grows in this tri-county area. Um, and I, I had joked before that we were having annual ribbon cutting celebrations because we had one in 2018. We expanded our emergency department 
And then we had one in 2019 when we opened up a freestanding emergency department in Converse. And I told everybody then that they were invited to one in 2020 because we have been expanding our hospital and we're uh, gonna be opening up the fifth floor here in a couple of weeks. And unfortunately we have been coronavirus. And so we won't be having the big exciting ribbon cutting that we were looking forward to, but um, we're gonna do a virtual ribbon cutting and try to work with many to get something out to everybody about that. But we're still excited to be able to continue to grow uh, to meet the needs of the community as the community grows and we are expanding our capacity and our service lines as well. So exciting time for us to grow along with you. And Michael, with, with this, obviously with this pandemic that's hit, has that, has that slowed the construction, slowed the growth at all? I would think that all it's going to do is enhance. I mean, you and I kind of joked, once you're finished, you're going to be ready for, you know, the next expansion. You're, you're going to have outgrown the, 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 the growth that you've had in your, in your facilities. Is, has that slowed any at all because of this? Yeah, so we, we were fortunate that the fifth floor, so we did a vertical expansion to add two floors to the hospital, the fourth floor and the fifth floor. The fifth floor um, was far enough along in construction that this didn't really disturb it at all. We wrapped it up, passed state inspection last week. We're just doing all the work we need to do to get it ready now to see patients. The fourth floor was supposed to be open by the end of this year, and that is not going to happen. That, that's going to be pushed off. Um, for, for some time down the road while uh, we get through all the other challenges that we have. So it is having some impacts um, in areas like that in terms of our ability to grow as quickly as we were expecting. I have um, four capital projects right now that were approved earlier this year, um, totally about $50 million investment here, and all of those right now are on hold. So it's definitely having an impact. Uh, th this question is going to be for both of you guys, but I'm going to start with Dr. Kellum. Uh, obviously, you've been doing telemedicine for, for about three years. Uh, this pandemic hits, and, and the telemedicine world really expanded. Can you talk to how that's grown, how it affects your patients on just a normal basis, and how it's, it's positively affected patients who have uh, questions on whether or not they think or they don't think they have the, the, the coronavirus? You know, it's interesting because we've sort of all been thrown into telemedicine over the last couple of months, but we were blessed enough to, to start prepping for this over the last three years. What I have seen is that it's, it's made a difference in terms of our ability to continue to, to touch base with our patient base. One of the biggest things that, that I have seen, and Mike probably could speak to that as well, is really patients' fear of coming into the office. And so although we do everything we can and, and in our practice, we have not had anybody sick in the office. Our staff has been safe. We've had five or six cases that we've, we've diagnosed, but all have recovered. And so, you know, it, it's really been a fear of going to the doctor and going to many places that has been the biggest issue. And what the telemedicine has allowed us to do is to continue to manage and take care of people um, despite all of this craziness going on around us. It's also been interesting because it's allowed us to reach out beyond the immediate community, the many rural areas where people really did not have easy access to care. And so it was a good way to be able to, to be in touch with people and kind of explain their symptoms, give a reassurance if we can, give treatment if needed, and really kind of direct them in, in the way that they needed to go to make sure that they were diagnosed if that was a problem, uh, a need, or you know, just treating them and, and pacifying their fears. And so telemedicine has been an interesting part of, of our practice. It really has grown dramatically. I think we're really wrapping our heads around that. And the nice thing I, I see, and people could speak to this probably a little bit differently from a different perspective, but the comfort with telemedicine is really starting to get there. One of our challenges initially was having people buy into the fact that you could see somebody um, via Skype, get a visit, get things taken care of, and feel comfortable that the diagnosis was right, the treatments were good, and people could recover and get better. And so that's where we have seen a, a significant impact in the use of telemedicine in our practice, both within our population itself and, and outside more to the general public. Michael, uh, from a hospital standpoint, has telemedicine expanded from what you guys do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, it has. So um, we have across Methodist Healthcare System, we have about 100 employed physicians. And in the month of February or January or December or any month prior to that, we had a grand total of zero telehealth visits. Zero. We, we had never really done it. Um, I haven't seen numbers lately, but I know that 
we, we started in mid-March trying to ramp it up. And by the first week in April, we were seeing more than 3,000 per week. And I'm sure that number has doubled or tripled since wow. then. In, inside the hospital, you know, particularly, we, we haven't had um, a COVID positive patient in the hospital um, on, the, on the inpatient side in about six weeks. Yes. If we have anybody, we transfer them over to Methodist Hospital where they're, they're keeping them all. So we are trying to maintain a COVID free environment here. But when we did have some um, several weeks ago, being able to do telemedicine right there with him in the room was, was tremendous because then we didn't have to don and doff all that PPE and burn through a bunch of that. The, the pulmonologist and the primary nurse would still need to go in there to see the patient. But if it was a consulting physician who was just gonna go in there one time to see him for one thing, we could do some of that really with them sitting at the nurse's station. And it proved to be very, very valuable for us just to limit that exposure and limit that burn on the PPE. And, and I'm We're guessing that, that. Uh, yeah, and I'm guessing that the telemedicine uh, component to, 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 to medicine is just going to expand. It's not going to stop. It's not going to slow. In other words, when this pandemic is not done, I think this is eye-opening to where it's just going to expand. Uh, Michael, would you agree with that? Yeah, so when you have moments like this, you also have innovation, right? I mean, you look back at our country's history and world World wars and things like that, that's when we become the most innovative. And so I think you're going to see a bunch of innovation spring from this. Um, as Dr. Kellen was saying, telehealth isn't new. It's just new that people are using it right. and people are having confidence in it and thinking, okay, I really can accomplish what I need to accomplish. Um, I can tell you if, if my kid has the flu or a sore throat or whatever, we're going to probably telehealth from the comfort of our couch into Dr. Kellum or urgent care or somewhere like that, rather than getting our sick kid dressed up, taking something for them to throw up in, you know, who wants to do that when you don't have to? And it can be pretty effective. And for uh, some doctors like Dr. Kellum and other docs, sometimes they, can, they find they can be more efficient. It, it can be challenging sometimes with the patient population. I, I try to imagine my almost 80 year old mother trying to FaceTime with me. And so trying to get her to do that with a doctor sounds painful, um, but you're, I, Dr. Kellum can probably speak to this, but I've asked my doctors, you know, cardiologists who a lot of their patients are older about how, how their patients have been able to adopt it. And they've basically said a lot better than I ever imagined. That is, that is very true. If I could say, you know, what we find is that that age population is exceptionally savvy when it comes to uh, working. I mean, most of them are on Facebook. They're managing through that very easy. And so one of the surprising parts of it is that it really is very simple uh, for a lot of them, and they have really taken to it very well. The, the traditional doctor-patient visit really was something I think that they had to get comfortable with, but I agree with you, Mike. I think that, you know, nobody wants to get out of their bed or out of their couch when they feel terrible. And it's, I think this is where telemedicine and telehealth is really going to find its place. What I think is going to happen, though, there's been such an emergence of this in a short period of time. I think we're going to have to find the balance where, where we sit between these telehealth visits as well as inpatient or in-office visits. Because there's certainly what I've come to realize over the last couple of months is that there's an absolute need for people to come into the office to lay hands on them to see them. And, and sometimes what that does is it buys us an opportunity to understand how sick they are and then give us an opportunity to get them in or move them in the direction that they need to go. And so as with anything new, it's, you know, it sort of has exploded because of the circumstances. I think, I think what will happen now is that we'll just figure out where we live in a, in a very comfortable place between doctor visits as well as these telehealth visits. And some of it may be for us simple as lab results and giving things that don't necessarily need people to miss work to come in, which really allows us an ability to keep information flowing to patients, allow them to get the scripts that they need without missing days of work. And so, you know, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for, for this whole endeavor to continue on, but I think the opportunities are going to continue to be great for sure. Uh, Michael, where do you think we are right now on, everybody keeps talking about flattening the curve. Have we done that? Where are we at in this pandemic? Do you see numbers going down? Do you see numbers spiking as we're starting to open things up here in, 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 this, in the greater San Antonio Tri-County area? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, so the numbers that you hear about regularly on the news are the number of positive cases. And they talk about it every day, how much it's gone up every day and the number of deaths. Now deaths obviously are, are a critical number, but in terms of tracking, 
I don't, those are, I don't look at either one of those numbers because if you think about the number of positive patients, that is very largely dependent upon the testing, how available the testing is and who we're testing. You know, early on, we were only testing patients that looked incredibly sick, right? Um, when you have outbreaks like we've had at Bear County Jail, you can look at your daily increase and they look huge and you think, oh my gosh, what's happening? Well, those aren't people in the general population. That's an outbreak yeah. in, in a specific area. So, so positive tests are interesting, but I don't think tell the whole story. Deaths are critical, but there's usually a two to three week delay from the time somebody <laughs> is infected to the time they die. And so that's not a real time number that's as valuable for me. I look at hospitalizations because what we really want to know is who's sick? How many people are sick? Is that number going up or down? And just to give you a perspective, um, across Methodist healthcare system, our peak for all night of our hospitals was a total of 38 positive patients throughout all of our all of our um, facilities. Huh. Um, we saw that number dip all the way down to 12 um, about three weeks ago and unfortunately we've seen that number come back up and this morning we're at 30. So we're going to keep watching it and see what happens but um, that to me is somewhat indicative is as we're getting out in the community again it, it just makes sense there's going to be more transmission. When the whole world was locked down, it was pretty difficult to transmit it. But now that we're out and about and we're socializing, which I think we need to do, I think we need to get businesses back to operating. We just have to be really smart about how we do it. So the flattening the curve, I, I think absolutely worked. And really the primary focus of that was to keep hospitals from being completely overrun, like what happened in New York City and what happened in Italy. And I think it was effective at that. But we, but we are by no means out of the woods. Um, uh, it's going to make it's going to require constant um, vigilance for some uh, time. Doc, Dr. Kellen, talk about testing. You know, obviously, uh, two types of testing that are out there. You've got the, the conventional testing, if you have it or not, and the antibodies testing. Uh, talk about both of those and the availability and, and the quickness of which those results are coming back. So for us, the nasal swab is typically what we're seeing right now in terms of our ability to diagnose active disease. And there we are, we are seeing the emergence of um, different methods of that that require or allow us to create some rapid screening. And so right now it's about a two day turnaround that we're seeing with that. Uh, but that I think is going to get better uh, over the next couple of weeks. And we'll be able, much like we do with the flu, you get in 15 minute turnaround. We understand if you have disease and then we can go about that and see. Antibody testing is, is emerging for sure. What I have seen from our standpoint is that the antibody testing that's out there, the coronavirus novel of COVID-19 is a, is a part of a coronavirus family, and there's multiple strains of this coronavirus. And when they're testing with the antibody now, you can see some, some positive antibody tests, but they're not specific for COVID-19 as it stands. It can be one of multiple different uh, cold viruses or coronaviruses that, are, that have been there. The, I think the tests, what we're going to find are going to be much more specific to COVID-19. And so we'll be able to get a very good understanding of whether or not someone either has active um, issues with acute antibody testing or see if they have had an infection and had some protection built up over time. I think that we still lack the understanding of how long that protection lasts, if it's something that's going to be a seasonal variation, if it's a long-term immunity. I don't think those answers are, are out there yet based on what I read and look at via the, the CDC. But the testing and availability of, of antibody testing is becoming more and more prevalent for us. And so, you know, it's a couple of day turnaround and, and we tend to get it. But I want to just speak to a point that Mike talked about. You know, what we see in the community in terms of the flattening of the curve is, you know, in usually any given year. So say we have a really terrible flu year or back in the swine flu days, for example, when that came. You know, when you heard that it was a terrible uh, epidemic out there, you would see day after day multiple people coming in with that particular illness. And what we have seen with this particular issue is there's been a ton of worry, concern, and, and talk about positive tests. But as a practice ourselves, we haven't felt that particular um, influx of patients that have been been that sick to that degree or being even testing positive for that much. So I do think that we've done a good job based on some of the things that laid out there to flatten the curve. But 
you know, when we look at our, our area, the number of cases versus the population is really very small. So risk is small. And certainly in certain age populations, risk of death is even smaller. And so, you know, I think we have to proceed with caution for sure. But I think from a medical perspective, I want people to understand that, you know, it's, it's a Sorry, something happened. But from a medical perspective, it's a good idea to begin to start, you know, be cautious in what you do, good hand washing, protection if you need to, but it is it is okay to start getting out and doing the things that you need to do. I know from a practice standpoint, and I can I can't speak for Northeast, but what I do know is that they've always been very attentive to quality care and making sure that they, they meet all of the quality cleanliness measures. And we have never seen an issue with that before. And so, you know, I think as a general rule, doctors and facilities have done a really good job and are very heightened um, and aware of making sure that, that everything is safe. And the reason I think that's important is because we cannot let other illnesses go by the wayside right now because you know we don't want cancer treatments to be let go or diabetes treatments to be let go because of the fear of this particular issue and so that's why i would encourage people to get back into routine in terms of seeing their providers because it's important that we maintain control of all these other things that may have slipped a bit through this crisis so uh, gabe let me can i just touch on that real quick because I, I think he's hitting on a really important point from a community standpoint um so I mentioned at Northeast, we haven't had a COVID positive patient admitted to the hospital in six weeks. And we have, we, we screen everybody at the door. We ask all the screening questions. We do temperature checks before anybody's allowed to enter. We mask everybody universally, whether they're a patient, a visitor, or an employee. Um, we have upped all of the infection protocols that you can imagine in terms of cleanliness, things that we're doing related to that. We have social distancing, we've removed chairs from waiting rooms, so you basically can't sit close to somebody else. So we, we've done a lot of these things in our, in our own practice, in our own hospital. And, and I have said this many times, and I truly believe this, that you are way safer walking down the hallway at our hospital than you are in a grocery store or in a pharmacy or in a restaurant because of all those practices that we have in place. The general community, though, still has the perception that Dr. Kellum was talking about that they're, they're afraid to get back in the community. And I, I want to give you a couple examples of that. We had a, a patient at one of our sister facilities who was diabetic, who was scheduled, already had a surgery scheduled to have a partial foot amputation. The patient canceled their surgery because they were afraid to come to the hospital. The patient waited and waited and waited. By the time they came in, it had spread to their heart and the patient died completely 100% avoidable, never ever should have happened. Um, I just learned last night, this is a side note, I was planning to talk about this today anyway, I just learned last night that a guy I went to high school with um, up in Oklahoma had a similar medical condition um, that he'd been receiving ongoing treatment for. He did not want to go to the hospital. His wife could not talk him into it, very treatable. And he finally was rushed in by EMS and he died yesterday. So, so that is happening, we are seeing um, more, more people come in for strokes via ambulance, but less coming in as walk-ins. And what's happening is people are feeling stroke symptoms and they won't come in until it gets so bad that one of their family members calls EMS. And by then there's less we can do for them. We're seeing the same thing with heart attacks. So that is the next community um, health issue that Dr. Kellum's talking about, that people who are avoiding care are, are hurting themselves and hurting their health status. So I, I want to encourage exactly what Dr. Kellum did is just know that there, there's nobody more dialed into safety than hospitals and physician offices right now. I, I would argue those are probably the safest places you could go um, because we're all dialed in 100% to it every day. It's what we do. But delaying the care is, is one of the worst things people can be doing to themselves right now. I just have a couple of questions. One, my, my question is, how do we get that information to the community in a better way? Um, I know we can get it to our Tri-County family pretty easily, but how do we really push that to uh, the community more? Do we get with our local city representatives? Where, you know, we have a really good relationship with all of these cities in the Tri-County area. Do we get with them and push information out that way? Because um, I, I have a friend personally, very good friend, who has um, 
chronic lymphoma and he's at a point where he needs chemo, but he's not going to get the chemo because he is afraid to, you know, go to the hospital, put his immune system more at risk. So I'm actually recording this and I'm going to send it to him. And <laughs> um, so that's one person that we can get to, but how do we really get yeah. that information out to the community? Uh, Many, that's a great question. And, for, and from a Methodist healthcare system standpoint, we're talking about that internally. How can we do this? And I don't think there is one easy answer. I, I think it is a lot of different things. You know, working with chambers, working with local community governments. I know that we have been talking to some of the press outlets, trying to help them um, put together stories that will resonate with the community. So I think it's a lot of different directions we need to go in. But it's, it's, a, it's a, an important message. I, I, from our standpoint, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing that has to be there is trust in your provider, because I think just hearing it sometimes is not enough. And so from what we're doing and, and um, is trying to craft a message that we send to our patient base that we have. And so I mean, we will text them. We certainly will reach out to them. We can get on a telehealth visit with them. That is one of the ways that we utilize that is to transmit information to them. But you know, I think it has to be a dialogue that is from the providers where they have a, a known trust and confidence in that we just start spreading that, that word to them and then to their family members so that they can look at that to see. And certainly, you know, any way that we can reach out to the community as a whole. But I think it would be very, for us, it's very effective when we personally reach out to them, talk to our patients, let them know what's going on. Our hope, as with many things, they will share that with their family members and, and begin to kind of ease back into to taking care of themselves like they need to. Because Mike's absolutely right. Those are needless deaths. Those are things that should not happen. And, and it's, it's even just complications that may not be deaths, but certainly difficult things that are hard to come back from. And so if you're not managing your triggers and you end up you know hurting your kidneys and you now have a you know a lifetime of dialysis that is equally as problematic in my issue because you know that's going to be a tough situation for family members the lymphoma case that you're talking about there's no there's no reason for someone like that to to suffer and or get closer to death if they don't need to because they are really being very aware and I think taking very good care of, of the patients and certainly the environment. I, as Mike talks about, we're making sure that our facility is COVID free so that people can manage and take care of themselves in a way without worry, but certainly without, without creating any kind of um, loosening of control of the varying disease processes that they have. So it's a, it's a major point in my opinion that really we need to start managing. And that's not even talking about simple things like immunizations and, you know, the flu's coming up. Are they going to want to go to the pharmacy? Things like that. I mean, this can really become a real issue, I think, for the community as a whole if we don't start addressing and jumping on this particular point right now. Uh, guys, one of, one of the things that has been – a, a, a point of contention, you know, one of those controversial topics is wearing masks. And uh, the misconception I think out there is that if you wear a mask, it's for you to not get the, 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 the disease. However, my understanding is that you wearing the mask is a way for you not to transmit it to somebody else. Uh, the percentage of those that are asymptomatic with this is, is to me alarmingly high. And the biggest risk that we see. Uh, Dr. Kellum, what is your stance on wearing masks out in the public, indoors, at stores, those types of HEVs, if you will? And no. just to add on that, if you'll also, there's a question in here that says, and what is the magic number being looked at to stop um, suggesting wearing the masks in the social distance? I, I, I don't know what the magic number is with that, I will tell you. I, I think where what we see, so there was, there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of the use for masks and the need for masks. And so I think what we find is that it is helpful. I think being in the community wearing a mask gives you a layer of protection that, um, that I think is, is really important to allow us to get back into our routines. There was a study out of Hong Kong that I saw that showed roughly a 52% reduction in transmission risk for people that wear a mask. So I think there is certainly there is certainly a benefit to it for sure. But what I would say to most people is that do it 
if you're comfortable with it, because if it makes you feel safer and you feel comfortable and you're more willing to get out and do the things that you have to do, it is a very simple thing to do. It will protect you. If you're sick, people should be at home. And so sick people should, should not be out in the community. If you're having fever, cough, congestion, in my opinion right now, it should, that's the time that you need to stay at home and, and not necessarily wear a mask unless you're seeking health from a healthcare provider. But I think the masks are a good idea in, in the general public because I think it'll just create one more layer of safety so that we don't have to worry about rebound numbers of, of uh, infectious cases going on. So, Gabe, can I, can I add to that? Sure, um, absolutely. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of masking and I, I wanna explain to everybody why. So it, it's kind of where you're going. I, I agree with everything Dr. Kellum said, but I just wanna to add to that. The, the greatest value of the mask isn't really for you it is for all the other people that you may encounter. And so I, I know there are, and, and I want anybody to raise their hand, please don't raise your hand because then I'll cover my eyes. I don't want to feel like I'm talking directly to a person on this, this call, but I might be. So I, I know there is a, there's a liberty component where people don't feel like they have to wear masks and nobody can tell them to wear masks. And I, I understand that we're, we're all Texans and no Texan likes to be told what to do. I totally get that. This is how I would encourage people to think about it though. This, this is a very easy, common courtesy that you can provide to your fellow human beings. You, you don't know who you're going to be next to in the grocery store. You don't know if they have underlying health issues. You don't know if they're immunocompromised. You don't know if they live with a 90 year old at home. You don't know what their circumstance is. So wearing the mask in public places, not when you're out walking your dog, I think that's kind of ridiculous. But if you're at the grocery store, you're somewhere where you're going to be within six feet of other people, or it's likely that you will be. I just encourage people, wear your mask, just do it to be kind to other people. That, if, if we can social distance, if we can be cognizant of that, and when we can wear our masks, we can get back to doing just about everything that we wanna do. I, I really think it's a critical component. And I will not be surprised if, how many months it is, three, four months from now, when kids go back to school, it would not surprise me at all if that's something that they require our kids to wear. And I gotta tell you, I would be supportive of that. That's just, that's the world that I think we're living in right now. Until we have a vaccine, that changes a lot. You know, I, I saw a great question from, from Dr. Sandy Wolf. Uh, Michael, I'm, I'm gonna ask you this question and that is uh, the, the, the testing that's out there, obviously it rolled out not as quickly as we would have wanted to have rolled it out. How has that affected the numbers overall, holistically? So uh, do you think the numbers are lower because we didn't have the test as early. What are your thoughts on, on the testing? And, and, and Dr. Wolf, if you want to unmute yourself, you could, you could better, obviously more eloquently explain that question. But uh, I, I think I kind of hit it on the head. Has that kind of messed with the numbers holistically? Yeah. So I think I, the I, rest I, of that, the rest of her question is specifically the antibody testing. Is that being included in those positive mm -hmm. COVID numbers also? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of answer the last part of that, and I'm going to kind of punt a little bit too, because there's been a lot in the media just over the course of the last week that there were states who specifically were including the COVID um, antibody test in there as well, because in their mind, these are people who had it, they weren't captured some other way. Um, I, I think most states are not counting those, and I think the ones that doubled them up are starting to peel those back out, and they're not counting the antibody tests for a few reasons, not the least of which, most of those antibody tests aren't very good yet. They're, they're not very reliable. Um, hopefully they will get better over time because I do think they could provide some, some valuable information. Um, so that's all, I, that's all I really know about the count and how it impacted or is impacting those overall numbers. When I, when I talked about what we're seeing in Methodist Healthcare System, none of those are based on the, the antibodies numbers. That's all pure um, PCR, nasal swabs, those kind of things. Um, I, I will just mention just real quickly on the testing to, to where Gabe was originally asking the question about um, the impact it has. If you want to go back in time and change one thing that would have made a big difference to everything, I think it would have been having far greater testing capabilities earlier on, which we could have had. The testing didn't have to go this way in our country, uh, but there are a, a series of issues at the beginning um, some of which involved the, the CDC's initial test that they distributed, and they, they weren't very receptive to private industry initially coming in, and we lost weeks at that time. 
and and still to this day our testing capability is way way better than it's ever been but we still don't have all the tests that we would like i mean i would like to test every single patient everybody would like to test every single patient that comes into the hospital we don't have that ability today nobody in the country has that ability today we still need to get to that point um so we we continue to lag where we could be and, and ultimately need to be in testing capability. Um, obviously a big thing, and I, me having a, a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old uh, and my wife going crazy every day homeschooling those kids. Uh, do you see us getting back to uh, some normalcy for school in, in, in the fall of, of 2020? Dr. Kellum, I'll ask you first. <laughs> Uh, well, good. You take that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what I can share is I have a patient who is a one of the uh, superintendents of one of the school districts uh, around the city. And they are in preparation for beginning the new year. Certainly there's guidance by the TEA. I think that they're laying out in terms of mask wearing, how they handle lunch, that sort of stuff. But I think there's an anticipation that when school starts that will be in the classroom. There will be some modifications for sure. Um, but you know, I think that's kind of where we're, we're at least going from here and, and sort of preparing themselves for that, at least as, as I've been told. Yeah, I'm just gonna add there, you know, there are a lot of um, pr predictions that there will be a second surge this fall, right? So as flu season typically kicks in, a lot of predictions that it will happen around then. Um, we could have a spike before then. I'm, I'm hoping that, that we don't. Um, it's, you know, the flu largely spreads when you start getting people back together in confined areas. Um, I, I would be, I'd be surprised and disappointed if we couldn't start schools this year, but I completely agree with Dr. Killam that it's going to be different. You know, lunchrooms are not going to look the way lunchrooms have looked in the past. And, you know, kind of getting back to at least my belief, I, I won't be surprised at all if kids are wearing masks and if they're Class sizes have to be smaller and spread out more. It wouldn't surprise me if they had to get creative. I would challenge them to get creative and think about staggering the school day where, you know, you have different grades coming at different times, so you don't have everybody in the school at once. Those are just decisions that I know they're going to have to be very creative about and figure out what the best thing to do for our community and our kids are. I don't, I don't uh, envy them. Yeah, Michael, how, how close do you think we are to a vaccine right now? I know that that's the big talk uh, amongst the big talks. Well, how close do we do a vaccine? Yeah, so my guess is as good as anybody else's. But uh, I mean, I'm, I, all my information for that comes from the media and, and I consume a lot of media trying to understand what the latest and greatest is. You know, there have been some, some recent studies that look, look really promising um, that think they could get some stuff out this fall. I, that would be amazing. That would be record setting if that could happen. Um, but it would be fantastic. Uh, you know, we initially had said about a year, which would put us, you know, through next February or so. My guess is probably somewhere in between those, but I, I don't have any better information than anybody else other than I just pay attention to a lot of media so I can understand what's going on out there. Okay. And Dr. Kellum, that, that seems like a really quick time. You've been in this profession a long time. You've seen several different diseases. I, I almost see that as an unrealistic expectation to have something this soon in the fall. Well, so, I mean, I think it's multifactorial, though. I, I think certainly we're seeing certain certain groups, I think AstraZeneca and, and Oxford University have moved some of their trials into phase two trials, meaning that we're getting a lot closer, a lot quicker than we typically would. I think some of it is regulatory um, burdens that are, that are lessened to allow us to move through that process a little more quickly so we can meet the demands that are necessary out there. I, I kind of agree with Michael, the things that I read and I look at, it, it, I think that as early as December, it's probably going to be a little bit later than that. And but I think it's going to be coming a whole lot faster than we typically see. The thing that we don't really understand, and I think Mike would agree, is that we don't understand if this is a seasonal virus, if this is something that is going to be consistent through the year. We understand that there's a new season. And we sort of treat, prepare, <coughs> we kind of wrap our head around that particular time period. We don't know what's going to happen. When you look at some of the, the countries south of the equator, where typically it starts and then it spreads to our area. I mean, there's been some evidence in Brazil that there may be some increased cases that are being seen. And so there's some potentiation that there's probably some seasonality to this. But I think those are still questions that we do not know for sure. And I think we need to understand over time, you know, some viruses come 
um, pretty quickly affect a lot of individuals and then burn themselves out and don't necessarily become part of our normal seasonal issue. Um, and so I think there's still some questions about with that, but I think we have to prepare ourselves for the fact that wintertime is gonna bring a whole new wave of this. But if we, we hit it with understanding, we hit it hopefully with a vaccine, I think as medicines are, are being understood a little bit better in terms of how they play in prevention and in treatment while in the hospital, I think we're gonna have a much better grasp on this and, and at least have more arrows in our quiver when it comes to treatment preventing this from being an issue. And, yeah. and I, I, go ahead. Sorry, Mike. I just wanna just add real quickly to that. A couple things about vaccines. One is, I don't know if everybody realizes this, but you know, we, we have a flu vaccine and only the 40 to 50% of Americans get vaccinated every year. Okay, come on people. So, so if nothing else, our flu vaccination utilization needs to go way up next year just to eliminate flu from, from the mix, right? So hopefully this has created a little bit of, of a, an awakening across the country to get the flu vaccine. Um, and uh, Dr. Wolf asked a question um, about if we have a vaccine, where do we think the vaccine is going to go? And, and I, so think about it this way. It's going to be let's say it's an American company that comes up with the vaccine. There's going to be global demand for that vaccine. And so I, I, I only imagine it would roll out initially to the highest risk patients, elderly, underlying conditions, things like that, maybe some frontline healthcare workers before it's uh, available to the masses. Now, if they can produce enough quickly enough, which will be a challenge. I mean, again, we're still talking about testing and there are a variety of companies coming up with the testing kits, and we still aren't ahead of that. So, so um, it, it could be a challenge just in production of everything. I know my uncle is a respiratory infectious disease physician in New York, and also oh, wow. um, a microbiologist. And he did say to me that the vaccine they're looking at 20, uh, 20 next year and 2021, and that it will it will first roll out to first responders, medical professionals, um, and those that are more compromised. Um, so, um, and, and that's, you know, coming from somebody up there that has a pretty good, so that, that is what's gonna happen first, like you said, and then after that, they'll roll it to the general public. Um, my, my question is, do you think that the flu vaccine, even though there's only a small percentage that gets it, they usually run out? So, or, you know, I've, I've gone to the doctor to get in there. They say they don't have it and send me down the road and send me down the road. And I've had a hard time getting it if you wait too long. So are they prepared to, because I think a lot of Americans will want to get that vaccine this year. Um, do you yeah. think preparing for that? that? That's a great question. And, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to tell you, get your flu shot early, young lady. <laughs> Uh, Let me know when you have them. <laughs> yeah, because because that does start to happen later in the flu season. It's it's pretty rare for them to run out early. You know, even by the end of the calendar year for flu vaccines, we usually usually we end up having a surplus. Um, but, but you know, they're producing that flu vaccine right now. They're working on that right now for stuff that's going to be distributed four or five months from now. So getting back to the idea of the vaccine and thinking about how much time they're going to need to produce the actual vials that they can distribute. You know, there's a, there's a time period where that has to happen, even if they find something that they say is successful. And with the COVID, all of the, a lot of the care related to that has, has been um, free um, to the public. Do you think that the vaccine maybe would be offered free also, or do you think that it would be a charge I really don't have a clue on that one. It'd be nice if it was free for everybody. I, I, I don't I mean, I, this is the type of thing I can imagine being free. Dr. Kellen, what were you saying? I was going to say, you know, from a testing standpoint, we know that coverage for that has been very good. I know the telehealth component of it related to COVID has been very good. And so they, they have credit, and we don't often see this, in my opinion, from, from CMS uh, Medicare, is that they've been very proactive in eliminating obstacles for people get testing done. My hope is that they continue that when the vaccine comes so that we can we can make sure that as many people get vaccinated as possible uh, and then we can get back to normal. I think they understand the economic impact of this well beyond just people's 
healthcare needs and healthcare issues. And so my hope is that they will continue. I have seen them, I, I know what you've seen, but we have seen Medicare step up in, in many different ways right now that, that I've never seen in my 25 years of practice. And so I think that they will hopefully continue to, to provide some support so that people don't have to be financially burdened or have to make a choice between, you know, buying this or being COVID free. I, and, and my hope and, is that they will continue to support. This is an off the wall question. It's directed at um, you, Michael Beaver. I'm sorry, my triplet. Um, so I have a lot of crazy friends. I found out more and more on social media with COVID and they're just one way or the other with their beliefs and I try to really ignore it. But one of the things that I was specifically, somebody asked me because of my position, they said that there, there's a rumor that the hospitals are being paid to put positive um, COVID numbers. And um, my, I laughed too. And um, I just said, most physicians are not going to put their license on, on the line you know, for a little bit of cash for the hospital. I know the hospitals are hurting, but I don't think that's the way they're going to go about getting the money. I kind of, but I want to get it recorded, your response. And just... so first, first, make sure you recorded my laughter. <laughs> Uh, I, I can I can absolutely positively tell you without a doubt that there is no truth to that whatsoever. None. Thank you. Great answer. All right, uh, <laughs> guys. Uh, my last question, because I know we're, we're we're getting close to that one hour, is on treatment. Uh, I know that that it, it, it's a deadly virus, but it's not a death sentence if you get it. Uh, Dr. Kellum, can you talk about some of the treatments? We've had a few patients that uh, that have tested positive. What are some of the treatments? Because I know there isn't a set FDA-approved treatment for this, but what are some of the things that you're doing when you do have a, a patient that is COVID positive? So a lot of what we do depends on the age range and where they're at in the disease process. So, you know, mild to moderate disease or mild to moderate symptoms in someone who's 35 years old, we probably just create supportive care, you know, control their temperatures, control their cough, get them feeling better. And most of those individuals proceed through the disease process without any real difficulties. If they start to have compromise in their, in their, um, breathing you know those are the individuals that we send to the hospital where again it's a lot of supportive care there's a lot of you know you hear about hydroxychloroquine how that works how that tends to try to um, slow down the replication of the viral process but, but there's nothing out there that's in that's that is um, really recommended in terms of treatments from that standpoint. There's questions about rhythmic issues associated with that. And so right now, what, what I think the mainstay of therapy is is supportive care. If we see a case and they're kind of sick, would we write some of the, the antibiotics and the hydroxychloroquine? I would definitely do that and have done that for some of our patients that are sick and, and they have done well. But there is no magic bullet when it comes to the treatments right now. There's some antiviral uh, medications that are being looked at that seem to be very positive, but they seem to be very positive and they're, they're really sick. I think we're really early still in the prophylactic treatments, meaning treatments that we give people so that they don't get the disease. Uh, and I think that there's still a lot that's open as far as that's concerned, but there's really not one particular treatment other than true supportive care, maintaining um, their ability to oxygenate. That's where the, the whole issue with ventilators and intubation is, you know, you try to support them until the viral load goes away and they begin to heal and are able to return back to their own breathing and normal state of, of health. And Michael, I'm guessing this, this phrase, albeit rudimentary, just be smart be smart out in the community. Uh, you know, people are talking about the myths of social distancing. That's not a myth. That is something that can help you from getting it. And, and ultimately that's the message is, is be smart, be cautious, and we can start to return back to normalcy. I completely agree. Be smart, be cautious, and be kind to others. 35% of the people that have it are 100% asymptomatic. So, there are people out there that think, oh, I don't need to wear it because they're saying that the mask is just going to protect other people from me. You may have the best intentions in the world and not know that you have it and give it to other people. So just be kind. All right. Uh, On that real quick, is, there, is yeah. it true that there is a certain blood type that, is, that can be a carrier and not have symptoms? Not, not that I'm aware of right now based on your study that I've read with that. 
Are you asking me? I don't know. I have, I've got zero medical training whatsoever. But I was not asking. You. Yes. Okay. Just just checking. Just checking. Um, guys, are there any other questions out there? This has been very helpful. Uh, Michael, thank you so very much for taking the time. Dr. Kellum, thank you so very much for, for taking the time and for all of our members and all of our friends to come in and just get information. And uh, again, you know, be smart, be cautious. If you, if you feel bad, call the doctor, call your provider, telemedicine. There are so many tools out there that you can get treated for. Uh, just, just don't ignore what you have, whatever it is that you think you have. If you feel bad, see the doctor, go to the hospital. Uh, so guys, thank you so very much. Do you guys have any last uh, words you'd like to share with the group? I want to say I've up? used, I, I am obviously not afraid. If I am not feeling good, I am either texting Michelle at Dr. Kellum's office or doing the telemed. Um, I've done the telemed a couple of times myself, you guys, and it's actually pretty awesome because you can, you know, get dressed from the waist up and sit and talk. Um, <laughs> Video, or you can call uh, because I was not feeling good at all for two months. It turns out I didn't change my air conditioning filter, so I think my allergies were really just killing me. Um, I got the swab. That was the most miserable thing ever, and that is one reason I don't love your staff. I mean, they really got up there. Um, but um, I will say that um, the telemed thing is awesome, you guys. So if if you're not feeling good, definitely try that first, and then they will tell you to come in if if they can't diagnose you over, which, you know, is what happened to me. So I love it. It's awesome. Thank you very much for having that. And they've had it for a long time and I've used it before, but now it's even faster. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. And please, um, Michael Beaver and Dr. Callum, if there's anything that Tri-County can do to help spread the message and especially about the don't be afraid to go to the doctor, don't be afraid. If you guys want to partner up with us in any way, please let us know. Um, Gabe is a good, an awesome videographer um, and he, he can do some videos for us if, if that's something that you're interested in and we can just push it out as much as possible. And I know that our city partners would share with their cities and on social media and things like that. So please let us know. Yeah, that's, that's great. I appreciate that offer, yeah. All right, so with that, guys, Mindy, if you want to dismiss the meeting, you're the, you're the head no, honcho. You Go guys. ahead. I know. Thank you guys for joining us again. I'm going to, um, this Zoom will um, go in the newsletter, and uh, if anybody else has any other questions, you can let me know. We, we have the resources, guys, so thanks again for joining us. We are going to try to have a real luncheon in June. Um, with the, the Hilton Garden Inn, they're going to do some social distancing set up for us, classroom style, six feet apart. Then we're not going to do a buffet. They're going to feed us um, a plate. Uh, so we're going to give that a go in June. So look for that information as well. But thank you guys so much. I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you, um, Michael Beaver. My, my triplet, guys, in case you don't know, he was born on Christmas like me, but he doesn't make quite as big of a deal of it like I do. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kellum and Gabe and Mitzi. Um, don't forget to look out for the information about the advocacy purse bingo virtual. Thank y'all. Bye, <laughs> Bye guys. Bye. Bye.